Good afternoon. Welcome to the Yale University Art Gallery, and thank you for joining us. I'm Rebecca Chantier. I'm the, Flo the former Florence B. Selden Senior Fellow in the Department of Prints and Drawings here at the gallery, and the curator of Seriously Funny Caricature Through the Centuries, which is now on view on the fourth floor. Today is my pleasure to introduce David Cypress, who will discuss his creative and intellectual process in his presentation, What's So Funny? In a career spanning six decades, David has used his pen and sharp observational skills to wittily capture the human experience and psyche, creating images and captions that resonate with readers and viewers. Offered in conjunction with Seriously Funny, his talk not only allows us to extend the ideas of the exhibition up to the present day, but also to incorporate the viewpoint of someone who's actively engaged with the production of visual humor. David began drawing in the late 1960s as a graduate student in stu Soviet studies at Harvard. He turned his fledging passion into a professional one, submitting cartoons to the Boston Phoenix, where he remained a frequent contributor until the newspaper's recent closing. For the past two decades, he has been a contributing cartoonist to The New Yorker, where he's also served as the inaugural daily cartoonist for the magazine's online operation in the, um, in the 2012 election. Aside from The New Yorker, David work appears regularly in Harper's, The Washington Post, Time, Parade, and Shambhala Sun. He has illustrated a number of books, including Your Cat's Just Not That Into You by Richard Smith <laughs> and The Little Stuff Matters Most by Bernie Brillstein. He has authored eight books, including Wishful Thinking, Is It Really Only Monday, The Secret Life of Dogs, and Sex, Love, and Other Problems. His talk today at the gallery has been generously supported by the Martin A. Ryerson Lectureship Fund. Please help me and join me in welcoming David. Thank you. Everybody hear me? So I would be remiss if I didn't, if I didn't start out by uh, showing you the one cartoon I did in The New Yorker uh, about this university. And I did it in 2016 when the newspapers were full of stories about how the miracle of the Yale basketball team making the second round of the NCAA tournament. Oh, there's something. Oh, sorry. This, here we go. No way I'm applying to Yale. It's a total jock school. <laughs> I have to say, this has been the most lucrative cartoon I've ever <laughs> made. Every single person who is even tangentially uh, related to the athletic department has purchased a print. <laughs> and I have a closet full of swa Yale swag, including a Frisbee. So um, <laughs> uh, my own education, as was referenced a little before, um, was at another uh, uh, Ivy League school. And the day that I quit and decided I wanted to help tell my parents I was going to change and be a cartoonist, uh, their reaction, well, this kind of captures their reaction. You're quitting school after everything we sacrificed for you? <laughs> it, it took me uh, 25 years to get into The New Yorker. And that's a long story, and I'll get to that in a little while. But I would like to show you the first cartoon I ever published in The New Yorker. And this one kind of reflects the painful struggle I just described. Are we there yet? <laughs> so uh, this talk is, is related to the exhibit, Seriously Funny, which I just viewed today. And if you haven't seen it, it's really terrific. And it, looking at it brings up a, 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 a number of connections that I'll try to make throughout this talk, uh, most of which are pretty tenuous. But um, one thing that strikes me is there's no question that when you go to that gallery, what you're looking at is art. And we cartoonists are kind of a mixed mind about that word art. Um, we want to be respected and considered artists, but we also uh, spend our lives poking holes in our own and anyone else's self-importance. So we're kind of in the middle. And my favorite cartoon ever done about that was by someone named Ed Fisher, who did this in the 1950s in The New Yorker. Why, no. I never thought of putting funny little captions at the bottom. <laughs> uh, 
In, in order to talk about uh, what I do, I'm going to first talk about my process. And kind of arbitrarily, I'm going to divide it into three parts, drawing, writing, and coming up with ideas. Those in the course of my daily life are never separated. They're always working together. But for the sake of this talk, I thought I'd separate them out and first begin to talk to you about drawing. I never went to art school. I'm self-taught. And so even as a kid looking in The New Yorker, what I admired were the simplest drawings, the ones that were most direct and looked like something I could do. And for me, that began with James Thurber uh, in the very early New Yorkers. You wait here, and I'll bring the etchings down. <laughs> uh, of course, like every cartoonist, the other main person I admired was Saul Steinberg. Um, and Steinberg, interestingly, refused to be called a cartoonist and only, uh, only wanted to be referred to as an artist. Um, and between those two and many others, I kind of taught myself to draw by looking in the magazine. Not only that, but I, I had another career along the way as a fine artist. Um, and I began looking at a lot of art. And there were two artists in particular whose drawing style really, really influenced me. The first one, who would have fit wonderfully into the exhibit, actually, is F Philip Guston. Uh, this is from Philip Guston's wonderful book uh, from 1970 uh, called Poor Richard. And for those of you who remember, what you're looking at there is Nixon, Agnew, and Kissinger as the glasses. Uh, <laughs> And I just love his style. And the other artist who I got great comfort from because of the, of the sort of primitive, childlike nature of his drawing, which s matched my own to a certain extent, was Jean Dubuffet. And my own st drawing style, I draw with a crow quill pen, which is a dipping pen. What I love about it is it's very difficult to control. So. Um, there are a lot of wonderful little accidents that happen along the way that often enhance the drawing. And sometimes, if they don't, there's always white out. Um, I, I like my drawings to be direct, as if when the viewer looks at it, they imagine that I thought up the cartoon and I draw, drew it almost in the same breath. I like the energy that that gives my work. I, I admire great artists like Charles Adams in The New Yorker who work with a lot of washes and make beautiful, involved drawings. But my particular preference is for that kind of drawing. And that leads me to a story about my drawing. When I first came on The New Yorker in 1998, times were still flush, and there were still big parties being given uh, two or three times a year. And the first one I was privileged to go to it was a kind of, uh, they're always sort of uh, intellectual celebrity marathons. Um, oh, look, there's Philip Roth. Oh, there's Salman Rushdie. Oh, what, should I get so close to him? Um, <laughs> and at this first one I went to, uh, one of my colleagues, a man I greatly respect who is far older than me, came up to me and is kind of swishing his drink. And he came up and he said, you don't belong in the New Yorker. What do you draw with a stick? And I was devastated by that, but I found my way back to feeling OK about it. A few weeks later, I published this cartoon in The New Yorker. Bad drawing. <laughs> I, here's another cartoon, a more recent one, where I came at the same issue kind of in a different way. I just wish I could loosen up like you. And it's a silly thing to point out, but I'm going to talk about it in a minute in caption writing. There, every little detail, every little thing has to be thought through. Uh, you see the guy on the right uh, has a large rock next to him. When I first drew it, I didn't have that rock there. And then I thought, well, somebody's going to look at this cartoon and think, how did he get up so high? And so that's the kind of silly thing we have to think about when we're composing these images, because you don't want the reader to ask that question in the middle of enjoying the cartoon. Caption writing is, is similar. Caption writing, the, captions are like thin filaments. 
and they can be ripped apart very easily by a punctuation mark or a wrong word or a rhythm that isn't quite right. Um, what, again, you want is for the reader to read the caption and get to the punchline without tripping over any obstacle in their way. Uh, this is a caption I'm quite proud of that is uh, about my growing up in an immigrant family. The country Grandpa came from was a stinking hellhole of unspeakable poverty where everyone was always happy. <laughs> and honestly, I struggled over, you know, stinking hellhole. That took me a while. I was very proud of that um, unspeakable, unspeakable poverty as well. And the important thing in this and many captions is what we call the kicker at the end. You want to hit the joke right in the last beat. Um, uh, he, another um, way to show you this is I'm going to show you a cartoon. It hasn't been published yet. Uh, I just sold it last week, actually. And I'm going to show you first the version of it that got rejected three weeks in a row. Use your core. <laughs> now, they kept, they kept rejecting this, and I knew it was a good cartoon. And I also knew in the back of my mind there was a way I could change one word and make it better. And as soon as I did, I sold it last week. Use thy core. <laughs> and, <laughs> What's amazing is how much funnier and how much um, deeper, actually, it becomes just by changing one word. And that's by way of showing you this art of caption writing. Generally, the rule in captions is less is more. You're always trying to take out anything unnecessary. I thought I'd show you some of my favorite captions. Here's a less is more, a, a caption that only has one word in it, and it is one of my favorite cartoons about art. Nancy! <laughs> Here's a wordier caption with a lot of words that also is a great cartoon about art. This one is by Alex Gregory. What I do as an artist is to take an ordinary object, say a lamppost, and by urinating on it, transform it into something that is uniquely my own. And finally, I'm going to show you a cartoon with no caption. <laughs> but I always maintain that this is a form of writing, um, in the sense that it's a little story. You kind of, when you're looking at this, you pretty much know what happened before, and you know what's going to happen in the end. And so you're kind of there in the middle. Also, what gets overlooked when we think about writing these cartoons is creating characters, just like a writer creates characters. Uh, I worked hard to make those two characters interact in a particular way. The impatient, OK, let's get it over with, you know, torturer. And the other guy just trying to get himself ready. Um, <laughs> their relationship is a kind of writing. So the next uh, part of it is what I called coming up with ideas. Um, th th what is involved most of the time is a lot of, almost a kind of meditation of sitting in the studio, letting your mind wander, hoping it takes you to some place uh, funny. The best, car the best thing I've ever seen about this is by the wonderful New Yorker cartoonist Ed Corin. My, my work is to stare into space. <laughs> Of course, that often results in a lot of this. It's not a nap if I'm sitting at my desk. <laughs> so this meditation, and often what I tend to do is I look in, kind of inside myself for things that I have strong feelings about, and most often that feeling is anxiety. Like many people in the humor field, anxiety is the richest source for me. Uh, so I might make a cartoon like this about an upcoming doctor's appointment. Don't forget to call it a procedure. Makes it less scary. <laughs> of course, 
the, the end of the line is also good for cartoons uh, uh, and also creates a lot of anxiety. Don't freak out. It's just to save the date. <laughs> And I, just to show you that I'm not alone in, in the uh, use of the anxiety as a source of humor, I'm going to show you my absolute favorite cartoon by the person everybody loves, Ross Chast. Two years younger than you, 12 years older than you, three years your junior, exactly your age, five years your senior, your age on the dot. Another thing that gets me both anxious and angry in my meditation process, of course, is the stuff that goes on in the world of politics and such things. I'm going to, the second half of my talk, I'm going to talk specifically about doing political work for the magazine. But I'm going to show you this next one uh, more to show you how the process of coming up with ideas can work in a way that feels almost magical. Um, in a way that feels like you don't actually come up with the ideas, they, they sort of happen to you. Um, several years ago, I was in my studio deeply disturbed by what I had been reading about all the problems in the Middle East. And I decided when I went in, I was going to do a cartoon about it. I was going to say something about it, something important. So I sat at my desk from 9 to 12, squeezing my brain, couldn't come up with an idea, nothing happening. Finally, it got to be lunchtime, and I, I sort of gave up. And I went over to the table where I keep my takeout delivery menus, and I'm uh, going through them, and I came to the menu from the King Tut Cafe. And the next thing I knew, I was sitting at my desk, and uh, this cartoon had appeared. Why is it we never focus on the things that unite us, like falafel? <laughs> And, and it, it's funny, but it really is uh, the most wonderful way an idea can come is sort of that completely by accident, unexpected moment um, that creates a sort of an almost a kind of inner thrill that I can't quite describe. And when that happens, it's almost the one, those are the ones you know are really good. That also can happen, the ideas can come a lot by beginning with a drawing. Um, this is a drawing that I did. Um, it's a situation I've, I've drawn a million times. It's the scene, the scene is a bar. Um, and I looked at this drawing for hours and hours. And then I put it away and I came back the next day. I, I tr what was the cartoon? I knew that there was a joke there. I knew, and finally, again, in almost a flash, this came to me. I ran out of room. Uh, another example of this, again, it's a scene, a bar scene. I have looked at this drawing or one version of it or other for many years. I often just go to work and draw this scene and try to think of a cartoon. This particular drawing, I looked forever. And I knew that somewhere in there, without changing almost anything, there was a golden nugget of a cartoon. I squeezed my brain. I racked my mind. I couldn't come up with anything. And then again, all of, almost before I knew what had happened, I had, I had written this in. Another way that uh, not only me, but all of us cartoonists sort of guide this meditation is by the use of the famous New Yorker tropes, the cliches. Um, the, the New Yorker has just published the Encyclopedia of New Yorker Cartoons. It's like 2,500 pages. And it's uh, divided according to basically these, sub these cliches. It begins with cartoons about Adam and Eve and ends with zombies. And, um, <laughs> It's a wonderful, although rather costly, uh, piece of merchandise. Um, 
but I wanted to show you that w one of the most famous, of course, is the desert island. There are millions of desert island jokes. And the thing is, what we do every week, I kind of use something like that in my batch that I'm sending in to see if I can take that cliche and push it to someplace it's never been before. Uh, and every one of my colleagues does the same. I'm going to show you four Desert Island cartoons um, to give you a sense of, of that. This first one is by Charles Adams from way back in the 1950s. By George, you're right. I thought there was something familiar about it. <laughs> this one is by the great new cartoonist in the magazine, Ed Steed. There you are. I've been looking all over for you. <laughs> And uh, here's one of mine, left-wing secular humanist. <laughs> and finally, I believe the artist who gets the prize for pushing the desert island as about as far as it can go is this one by John O'Brien. <laughs> now, uh, the cartoonist also does not just work in the studio. Uh, I have something I think of as my cartoon brain. And it's functioning all the time. Who knows what this lecture will lead to. Um, give you some examples of cartoons that popped into my head when I wasn't trying to think of cartoons, when I was just living my life. Here's one that came to me waiting for endlessly for a subway in New York. Due to an incident at the Bergen Street Station, Everything has changed, and nothing will ever be the same. <laughs> now, one place I probably shouldn't be thinking up cartoons is when I'm having a serious discussion or even something verging on an argument with my wife, but I can't often help myself. Well, if it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong, why don't I be right and you be wrong? <laughs> Uh, once in the doctor's office, I came up with this next one. Um, it was interesting, in the show, there's a, a, a print by someone named Peter Jans called Quack in the Barn, and I thought uh, making fun of the medical profession is a long-standing uh, tradition. Um, so this is a cartoon I did, came into my head while my doctor was giving me certain pieces of uh, relevant information. I can cure your back problem, but there's a risk you'll be left with nothing to talk about. <laughs> Yoga class, not a place you should be thinking up cartoons, but again, uh, really couldn't help myself one day. I'm lying in Shavasana trying to free my mind, and this happened. Why so downward facing, dog? <laughs> And even just sitting home watching television. <laughs> so uh, great cartoons, for me, are a kind of juxtap juxtaposition. They bring together something very familiar and something unfamiliar, and put those two together in a way that explodes into a, into a cartoon. Um, You've seen it in almost all the cartoons I've showed. I'm going to show you two of my all-time favorite New Yorker cartoons um, where the drawing, the caption writing, and the idea are just amazing. And the juxtaposition that I talked about is brilliant. And at the same time, as you've been experiencing these cartoons, you've noticed that there's like a, almost a kind of comic timing. You look at the picture, and then you read the caption. And that, that's sort of a wonderfully built-in thing about doing what we call gag cartoons. And it's almost always obvious in a situation like this where things are big, but it goes on all the time. And the comic timing in these two cartoons is also terrific. The first one is by the great New Yorker cartoonist, Sam Gross. I don't care if she is a tape dispenser. I love her. <laughs> Uh, 
it's so simple and so beautifully drawn and, and so brilliant. This next one as well, same deal by the great cartoonist Danny Shanahan. You slept with her, didn't you? <laughs> Now, to, that's about what I'm going to talk to you about my general process of doing the work. Um, I'm going to move on now in a way that uh, connects a little bit to the exhibit and talk to you about doing political, topical cartooning for The New Yorker, which is different from doing that uh, from, for any other publication. Uh, but first, some general challenges about doing political cartooning at this moment in time. The first thing is, it's, it feels with the internet like it's almost impossible to do something new that hasn't been done before. Um, if I hand something in, I have to spend an hour making sure on the internet that nobody's done it before me. Um, that's, a, that's a hard part about doing it these days. Also, I mean, if you go down to the exhibit and or over to it, and you'll see that exaggeration is such a huge part of humor. Um, for example, the caricatures are all about exaggeration, all about making the small grotesque. Um, and the only trouble for me now and for my colleagues is that exaggeration in the current environment in this country has become reality. Uh, there's only one way I can describe to you how this functions for us as cartoonists by showing you this amazing cartoon by a young guy named Robert Layton. Stop! That Trump cartoon you came up with this morning just happened. <laughs> and it's a joke, but it's really true. It really uh, makes things difficult. Um, the, I'm going to talk about my work in the print magazine, and then in a while, my work uh, on the website doing something called the Daily Cartoon. Uh, doing the print magazine cartoons, uh, it's, it's interesting to compare them to all what we think of as editorial or political cartoons. Throughout its history, New Yorker publishes, publishes politically themed cartoons only if they are of a particular non-advocacy, let's stand back and see, observe everything and see how funny everything is, uh, not kind of taking issues on directly. Um, it's, it's a, it makes it a difficult challenge, um, but in a few minutes here, I'll be able to show you, I hope, ways that it, it becomes an interesting challenge for a cartoonist who's trying to make a, an, a comment about what's going on. So I'll show you a few examples of mine that are, that are in that vein of sort of uh, taking one step back. This first one uh, is this one. That was Brad with the Democratic weather. Now here's Tammy with the Republican weather. <laughs> this one touches on another issue. The subject of tonight's discussion is, why are there no women on this panel? <laughs> I hear it's because we're right and they're wrong. <laughs> and then one that really doesn't make much of a point that I just always thought was funny. How can they possibly hope to defeat us when their generals have such small hats? <laughs> the rule in the print magazine for the cartoons is that uh, the editor, David Remnick, and before him, all the other editors, do not allow caricature. So this is, creates a difference between what I do and the show, the exhibit. Um, it's just, I, there, there are reasons for it, but characters in the New Yorker happen on the cover. Um, this is a wonderful one by the great uh, artist Barry Blitt. And this next one is by Tom Bactell, who for years has done the caricatures in the talk of the town. But for the cartoons, in the cartoons themselves, we're not allowed. 
And so that, like many uh, limitations on, on an artist, can also be a creative opportunity. I've kind of dealt with it in a lot of ways, but one is by replacing a particular political figure or a government in general with an image of a king. Um, so I'm not directly showing a particular person, but I'm using this suggestive image of a king. On the other hand, he's really good on infrastructure and tax reform. <laughs> I'm concerned about my legacy. Kill the historians. Uh, in 2005, I did this next cartoon, and I figured out another way to get around it, which is I drew George Bush from the back. Um, what's funny about this cartoon is it was hilarious in 2005. I'm not sure that it even manages to be a joke in the current exaggerated reality we live in. You know who's a big pain in the ass? Europe. <laughs> There's George. So all in all, Cartoons in the print magazine go at issues in this indirect way. Um, and the rule, the main rule, is to be funny. Funny above everything is what they get judged on and what, whether or not they get bought by the magazine. And so uh, you're not trying to hit the reader over the head. You're trying to kind of get into the reader's head with humor. Uh, I'll show you a couple more of mine that I feel do this effectively. As a potential lottery winner, I totally support tax cuts for the wealthy. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to do an editorial cartoon about tax cuts, um, but this is the New Yorker way. This next one is a, uh, kind of about the issue of religion, and I actually thought this one up in the course of a, uh, my wife and I for a while were in a reading group, uh, with a few exceptions, a bunch of us uh, people of the Jewish faith, reading that hilarious document, the New Testament. <laughs> and I came up with this cartoon. Quit worrying about corroborating your sources. It's not as if anyone's going to take all this literally. <laughs> Finally, my favorite example of this indirect approach is my favorite cartoon about Trump that's ever been done. It's by a colleague of mine named Paul Noth, who is brilliant. And you'll see, Trump does not appear in this cartoon. If you were on another planet, you wouldn't know it was about him. Um, and what you'll find interesting in it is it forces you to think for a minute to make the connection. And my theory is that that moment of thinking it through is what makes the cartoon get inside your head, stick inside your head, the way a more direct approach might just hit you over the head. Um, and it gives the cartoon a really fascinating level of complexity. He tells it like it is. Now, the Daily Cartoon. This is, this is where things loosen up a little. Um, I've been the Daily Cartoonist several times on the New Yorker website, starting in 2012. For the first few years, uh, there would be one cartoonist covering two or three months every single day. And uh, you had to come up with a cartoon by 8 o'clock in the morning, send it in, and at 9 o'clock it would be put up on the website. Uh, so it was uh, a high-pressure situation. Um, and uh, that has changed a little now. Now there's a different cartoonist every day, and the process is a little different. But for three or four years, for long periods of time, I did this daily cartoon. And the first challenge with that is how everything in this age with the internet is speeded up. and you really have to be on top of things every minute. And the best example I can give you, I did this cartoon at 7.15 in the evening on election night, uh, November uh, 2016. 11 o'clock at night, 
I did this one. <laughs> I had to be, you know, nimble. Uh, I always thought no, I knew myself really well and that I would have a lot of problems with this high pressure thing where I had to produce in such a pressure cooker situation. Uh, and I was really worried about it, but I realized as I got older, that sort of a thing is, has been less of a problem. Thank goodness you're here. I can't accomplish anything unless I have a deadline. <laughs> So part of this daily cartoon routine is that you get up, I got up, I would read the paper, I would sit down and make a cartoon. And what was wonderful about it was after a while, when I got in the flow, I, I realized that I was making almost a direct connection with my readers. It felt like my readers were reading the same thing I was, and then about an hour later, I'd to say something to them about it. And that was really exciting and very different from working in the print magazine and, uh, and, and completely invigorating. Uh, I'm going to show you one of the car like an example is this one I did uh, not long after Mr. Trump spoke at the UN. Everybody hates us. That's our foreign policy. <laughs> Caricature on the website is permitted. Here's another one. Tell them to call back. I'm meeting with my advisors. <laughs> if you go, if you look at the uh, seriously funny exhibit, you'll see that um, a lot of the humor is about uh, making fun of recognizable types in society. And that is also something that I like to do in my cartoons. Um, there's a Do Daumier and Hogarth and people like that were masters of that. Um, so I have one example of one of the cartoons I did for a daily cartoon that uh, falls in that category. I'm sorry, but it's against my religion to serve middle-aged heterosexual couples with matching shih tzus, wearing skinny jeans and Uggs, and camo shorts and God-themed t-shirts. <laughs> What I, what I really, really aim to do is to boil these issues down to the simplest possible form. Um, I'm going to show you three where I feel like I succeeded in doing that on the website. Uh, here's another one. I blame the media. <laughs> and finally, this one I did around the time uh, the wall, hold, wall thing started to come up, uh, Thanksgiving 2016. <laughs> One unfortunate consequence of doing the Daily Cartoon is that you have to immerse yourself in the news day in and day out. And I can tell you, after a couple of months of it, it, it just, it's soul killing and uh, incredibly depressing. And I'm gonna, the next cartoon I'm gonna show you, you probably have all have seen it. Uh, wasn't done recently, but I, every time things change in the news, it, it becomes a meme, it becomes, it is the most shared, most reprinted, most stolen cartoon of my entire career. Um, it talks about how I, have, I feel. My desire to be well informed is currently at odds with my desire to remain sane. <laughs> and what's interesting about this cartoon to me is I ask myself, why do people love it so much? Why does it get reprinted, honestly, far more than anything else I've ever done? Because there's, there's not actually a joke there. Um, I can, there's not really a joke. But it's the humor of recognition. I, um, I was noticing again in the uh, seriously funny exhibit how uh, talking about Tiepolo and his Puccinello, how the audience, the, the readers love to see themselves in Puccinello. And uh, that's what's going on here, I think. Uh, I feel something, I make a cartoon about it, and people see 
themselves in it. And somehow, for whatever reason, that makes them laugh. Um, and it's, it's, an, it's just interesting to me. And also, I've come to realize it's sort of my specialty in doing political work. I don't, um, I don't do very well doing sort of hitting people over the head or making uh, strident points. What I do, I think, really well is say something that I feel that connects with my audience um, because they're feeling the same thing. And again, that connection creates the humor. Oh, sorry. So I'll show you a couple of uh, recent ones that I did on the website that I think fill that category. Tonight at 11, that giant asteroid that's about to obliterate the planet, how will it affect the midterm elections? <laughs> Again, I, I can't emphasize enough that being funny is the New Yorker, the first uh, demand of any cartoon for the New Yorker, including on the website. You, if it's not funny, they're not going to buy it. Um, and funny is what I try to do. Here's another one. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, even though nobody knows what that is anymore? <laughs> Doing these kind of cartoons also it, are uh, demonstrate that I have given up on the whole idea of trying to change. Pe you know, some cartoonists think they can actually change people's minds with their cartoons. Unfortunately, in the magazine that I work for, and given the readership, I'm always just preaching to the converted. And so, changing people's minds, even if I thought I could do it, would be impossible. Um, and so. I, d I don't try to do that. I, when I said before, it's hard to do, say something new. When I'm trying to get at saying something new, what I go to is, again, what I think is my strong suit, which I just uh, described. Here's one more from very recently. <laughs> now, uh, in preparation for this talk, I was thinking about this issue of in the end, about political cartooning, what's, when are things not funny? Um, how do you deal with things that are tragic if you're a cartoonist? Uh, right after 9-11, uh, the issue of The New Yorker that came out that week had a black cover by Art Spiegelman. And for the fir only the second time in the history of the magazine contained not a single cartoon. Um, the, the first time was... Uh, John Hersey's Hiroshima in 1950, whatever it was, or whenever it was, also had no uh, cartoons. Um, this was only the second time. And as cartoonists, we were all being made intensely aware of the challenge at that moment. At least one cartoon ha I hand in a week has a building in it, or a sky, or maybe an airplane, or almost anything at that moment in time could remind people. And so it was a real struggle to figure out how to make an image that would be antiseptic in that way. And secondly, people just weren't in the mood for, la for laughing. Um, and you'd say to yourself, well, people need to laugh. But really, it took a while before you could actually, it was, you could actually get people to that place. And I want to show you the very first cartoon that was published in The New Yorker uh, right after, uh, the week after the 9-11 the issue. It's by Leo Cullum. Leo passed away a few years ago. He was actually a TWA pilot his entire life and actually thought up his cartoons while he drove the plane. Um, and this was his wonderful cartoon that was a breakthrough for all of us. I never thought I'd laugh again. Then I saw your jacket. <laughs> And then the floodgates opened. Um, another situation, a tragic situation, was the, re the bombing in Paris. Um, that was another really challenging moment. And I feel really good because I, I did this cartoon, uh, and I was able, in this case, I think, to make a cartoon even in that particular time. 
What goes on down there in the name of religion is turning me into an atheist. <laughs> so getting away a little from just sort of political work, um, a lot of, I, I keep referencing the seriously funny exhibit because uh, it's helpful to do that. And there's, in that exhibit, you see not only political satire, but you see social satire. And a lot of my work and a lot of the work in The New Yorker is social satire. Uh, and I'll show you a few examples of what I consider some of my better ones. This one is from very recently, and it's an example of there are certain words or phrases in the, in the general conversation that for a cartoonist sort of hang from a tree like ripe fruit, just dying to be made fun of. And um, I don't know, sometimes they just catch my eye or in my ear. Uh, this next cartoon, there's a word I've been seeing everywhere used in all kinds of contexts where it, it almost didn't make sense and was get, allowing people to get away with all kinds of lack of specificity. Uh, so I did this cartoon and it appeared in a recent magazine. Lawrence knows that goes, never goes anywhere without his ecosystem. Uh, television often pr provides these ripe fruit. <laughs> this next one is a mishmash of two cultural references, social satire references, kind of mushed together into one. Computer, order me two long sleeve cotton crewnecks and dark wine and green, le green heather. <laughs> and then there's this. And then every once in a while doing these kind of cartoons, I like to uh, kind of touch base with my people, with my peeps. Thus the yard birds begat cream. Spencer Davis begat traffic. Cream and traffic begat blind faith. Blind faith begat Derek and the Dominoes and Ginger Baker's Air Force. <laughs> So, uh, and again, so on this issue of cultural references and in, in, in humor, there's a wonderful woodcut in the Seriously Funny exhibit. I have a very lousy slide of it. It's uh, Nicola Boldrini, Three Monkeys Imitating the Laocoon, La uh, and uh, it's taken from Titian's original of this. And for those of you who didn't have a big Jansen uh, you know, textbook when you took art history in college. This is the, the sculpture that's being referenced, the Laocoon. And I just think it's wonderful that I can show you the following, which is a uh, Charles Adams cartoon from the 1950s. <laughs> and my favorite thing to say about this is that even in the 1950s, when he did this cartoon, the magazine bought it because they knew that the audience would understand it, would understand that cultural reference. I'm telling you right now, that part cartoon would not get published today because that particular reference has kind of slipped away. Uh, so I'm going to show you an example of one that very definitely could and did get published with cult cultural references that are really of the moment. by the cartoonist Matt Diffie. So uh, finally, um, I thought I'd talk briefly about the whole process, the editorial process at The New Yorker. Um, what I do and my colleagues do is every week uh, you do 15, 10 or 15 rough drawings of sketching out ideas that you've, you've gotten. And you submit them either by email or you bring them in and meet with the cartoon editor. And honestly, if you, I, I can't do the math, but that's a thousand cartoons a year or something. And if I sell 30, I'm doing really, really well. So there's a lot of rejection. Um, if you had a problem with rejection, you shouldn't be a cartoonist because it's, it's really built into the process. What's interesting about it is, I, the beginning of the talk, I showed you the uh, use your core, use thy core cartoon. 
I've never once been, in all my 20 years of the magazine, I've never been edited in the sense that the editor never called me up and said, you should change that word, or that something should be moved in that drawing. Most of my career, the editor was someone named Bob Mankoff, who retired two years ago. And he sometimes would mentor the younger cartoonists, but I never got a single bit of editing. And what's interesting is that the rejection itself becomes a kind of editing. I mean, that cartoon, use your core, use thy core, I was edited by the fact that it was rejected. And yet I knew there was something good in it. And then the second time it was rejected and the third time. And that's the way I edited myself. Another way it happens is um, when you put your, see your work in the magazine, it's kind of shocking all the time that this little private thing you did is suddenly out there in this context. And that also can give you a kind of general editing about your drawing, how to improve your drawing, how to improve your ideas. Um, but there's never been a moment of direct editing in my whole experience. And I'm actually really glad about that because I've, it, cartooning is one thing for me that um, I like to completely own myself. I don't even show my wife my cartoons before I hand them in. I just, uh, it's kind of a private conversation I almost I have with myself, and uh, I don't want that editing. So um, I bring in these cartoons, and then what happens is, and today just happens to be Friday, right now, on my phone, there may or may not be an email from Emma Allen, a Yale graduate who's now the cartoon editor, saying, oh, we love this one. We sold, you sold this one this week. So on Tuesday, you bring the work in, and on Friday, you find out. Um, and uh, what's interesting, again, is that a lot of the ones that get rejected, I resubmit. Again, this editing process. If I think it's really good, or I think it needs to change a little something. And so it, I calculated lately that more than half of the cartoons I've sold to The New Yorker, I've sent in more than once. Um, the editor is looking at 1,000 cartoons a week. She's going to forget one. She's going to miss something. So I keep handing in ones that I feel good about. And uh, many times, they get bought the second or third time around. Um, as I said, the, the new editor, Emma Allen, is 27. Bob was 72 when he retired. So there's a bit of a change of uh, um, perspective that's happened. And one good thing that's happened is Emma has brought on a lot more women cartoonists. Now it's almost 50% women cartoonists. Two years ago, it was 10%. And um, that's been a great change. And also, she has a younger sensibility. And so there's a different kind of humor. I didn't want to get into the, what that is, but in general, I think there's a new direction in a lot of the humor that is, uh, I sort of think of as meta humor, self-referential humor, less, a uh, little less of what I do, which is looking out and making comments about stuff in the world, but funny stuff, but different. Um, and I've had to adjust to that. Everybody always wants to know about the caption contest. The caption contest is enormously popular. Um, I don't know, 20,000 people a week play the game. The, and um, I just want to show you one funny thing about it, which is uh, this is one of mine from several years ago. And I am not unique, and this isn't unique in my experience. The caption that was, that was the final cap, well, how these work is you, I hand in this cartoon with a caption. Then I get an email from the editor saying, we love the picture. We, we're going to take out the caption and put it in the caption contest and see what people come up with. Fine. <laughs> when they first started doing this, we were all like, oh, are they telling the public that what we do, anyone can do it, that it's easy? <laughs> but in fact, right pretty soon I realized it's sort of the opposite. It gives people an insight into all the stuff I've been talking to you about today, a little bit of a window into how hard it is to do what we do. Um, but what's interesting <laughs> is that the caption that won this cartoon contest was the very same one that I had on the cartoon to begin <laughs> with, because it's not there. <laughs> Finally,
part of the editing process in general at the magazine is the famous fact-checking. You've all heard about it. Um, I'm going to show you a cartoon that I sold a few years ago. This was the rough draft I sent in. I'm having my entrails read. <laughs> this is the email I got from the editor. Day, David. I have one question about your finish for I'm having my entrails read. We had a couple of fact-checking queries. Apparently, the sacrificial knives were normally single-edged blades with a curve towards the hilt, like the attached image, which I'll show you. And also, the temple in the background has five columns on the front, whereas they usually have an even number of columns. Might you be able to do a small edit on this finish if I return it to you? Sorry to be the messenger on such particular queries. Here's the image that they sent with the correct knife. <laughs> Here's how I responded. Colin, I will make the suggested changes, but I have a question of my own for the fact-checking department. I understand that they have a problem with the inaccurate knife and the incorrect number of columns, but what about the fact that the drawing includes a talking goat? There's the final. And finally, in, in this age that we live in, if you are on the, in the media, you're going to get comments. They're going to, you know, Facebook, Twitter, I'm on all of them. And I, I, if I wanted to uh, kill myself, I would pay attention to the comments. I've long since gotten over that, although sometimes you can't help yourself and you spend the entire day doing it. Um, but in the old days, maybe 10 years ago, uh, it was letters to the editor that uh, how I receive the comments. And I just show you this, uh, my favorite letter to the editor about one of my cartoons. Here's the cartoon. <laughs> and here's the letter that came. To the New Yorker, David Cypress. In the current 227 issue, I see a cartoon in which an elderly woman is noting the declining height of an elderly man. We might presume her husband. They are both white, of course, and the male who is declining, of course. Another joke on all white males, ha ha, the wit. Here's another joke. Imagine William Shawn, the famous New Yorker editor of the old days, allowing this cartoon into print. Ha ha, that is funny. It's nice, I'm sure, to be young and rude, but someday you'll be old, unless, as is my wish, you drop dead first, <laughs> cordially. So you never know what's going to piss people off. <laughs> and I'm going to end on my favorite cartoon about this university by my dear friend and the late, brilliant, New Yorker cartoonist, Bob Weber. Um, I've always loved this one. Son, can you spare a couple of minutes to talk about your tuition? <laughs> so with that in mind, I'm happy to take any questions from you guys, um, if you're interested. Yes. Hello? Yeah. Well, what's similar about them is that they involve that wonderfully unique combination of words and images. Um, in other ways, that storytelling in comics is very different from storytelling here. Um, this is a particular skill. That's a very different particular skill. A lot these days, because people are trying to make a living and have to branch out, when I was starting, you could actually make a living doing this. Um, people are now getting into comics and stuff on the internet, and so they're expanding what they do to doing long form. Uh, Roz Chass, uh, Liana Fink, a number of artists have recently published cart uh, memoirs, which are combined drawing and writing. Um, and so they're not as separate as they used to be. For me personally, I what I oddly what I do this and I write prose, um, but I don't do a long form thing because I 
I'm just more interested in this. She's bringing the microphone. I grew up with New Yorker cartoons from an early age, and I thought that we could always understand them. But recently, it seems to me, there have been some captions that are in jokes. And is that just because we don't follow all the social media? My friend, they are in jokes for all those people that aren't in the same category as you and I are. Uh, <laughs> um, the humor has changed. I don't necessarily get a lot of those. I know exactly what you're talking about. but. Um, the magazine has to say, stay young and stay vital, and that those are the those are the jokes that seem to be appealing to the younger audience. The magazine is more on the in the internet now than it, on, online than it is a print magazine, and the people who are reading that like those jokes, reading it that way. So um, I sympathize. I understand. Nothing we can do. Um, so I was curious, how many cartoons did you submit before you sold your first one? And how would you suggest going from political caricature to New York style cartoons? Okay. Um, well, the first part is a long, sad, tragic story. <laughs> 25 years I submitted. I started in the early 70s. Um, and uh, people say, well, why did you keep doing it? And the answer is that if you do what I do, there's really only the New Yorker. Um, everything else, you, you always feel like you're in the minor leagues. And so I persisted out of a strong desire. And fortunately for me, the cartoon editor changed in 1997. Um, and the new editor, Bob Mankoff, had been a fan of my work. And I finally, <laughs> my life changed. Um, and so that many cartoons preceded my first sale. As far as your second question, um, I, I would begin to think about not just uh, about interactions between people and dialogue. And, but at the same time, I would, I would just move away from the drawing board and think about what's funny for you in life. And it doesn't mean what's necessarily what's haha funny, but like I showed you, the things that worry you, the things that make you angry, Stuff like that, and see if you can make a joke out of that, and then turn it into a little play, a little dialogue. That's the best advice I can give. I don't know if that was helpful. I... Um, the New York Times eventually was printed in color. Steinberg worked in color. Um, what are your thoughts about color? The internet technology enables color at no additional printing cost, not that they're relevant. Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, and there's a lot more color in the cartoons in the New Yorker now than there used to be. Um, I tend to use it like I did in the one with the, uh, I use it as a sort of intention grabber, a spot of color. Um, I'm much more comfortable with simple line drawing. Um, it's just what I've always done. Uh, but uh, color is, I mean, if you looked at New Yorker 10 years ago, in every aspect of it, there's a lot more color than there used to be. Um, every week now, there's a, none of the cartoons tend to be full color, but a more uh, expansive use of color than I do in a lot of the cartoons. So um, I, uh, William Sean, the longtime editor of the New Yorker, had a thing he used to say when a cartoon was brought in with color, he would say, red isn't funny. Um, well, that certainly turned out not to be true, but uh, that was the theory for most of the life of the magazine. OK. Thank you. Thank you.